Welcome in once again to another episode of XFL Fantasy Central. I'm your host, Rod Gomez. You can find me on Twitter at RJ Gomez. Find the show on Twitter at XFL Fantasy Cast. Week one is done. We have got actual legitimate football to talk about. We're going to talk about some fantasy leaders, uh, a little bit of waiver wire of who you might want to pick up. Uh, but then it is an ESPN take over. We are going to talk sports betting with David Behrman uh, of ESPN, and we are also going to talk to the great one, Matthew Barry, the man himself, the fantasy guru. Uh, it, that's I cannot wait for you to hear Matthew Barry. So uh, let's go ahead and just get on with the show because I know you're waiting for it. So here we go. The time has actually finally come where we get to actually dig into some real statistics from real games and actually break down some real performances. Uh, I, I just I almost felt like this day was never going to come, but here we are, and and we have a lot of great stuff to get to today. Actually, here's what we're going to do, okay? And I'm, I'm going to toy around maybe for the next couple of weeks at least to figure out the best way to present the kind of game recapping because, look, Everybody does breakdowns. Everybody does game recaps almost the same way. So I, I like to be the guy that does things a little differently. I like to present the information in, in a way that not everybody else is doing it. And so um, I know that people have their power rankings and stuff like that and, and their waiver wire and, and you know, uh, all that stuff. So my philosophy here in this in this first part of the, the first episode of the week um, is, is I'm going to actually give you guys what I call three up, three down, and three to grab. What that means is uh, three players that really performed spectacularly and and could have won you your contest and or uh, your league matchup. All right. Now here's the thing: I, I'm not going to ignore season long altogether. We're going to talk about waiver wires, um, but I will say that I don't know your league's setup. I don't. There's a lot of different league setups out there. Um, there's not even one standard way that everybody sets up their league. So I'll talk about players and stats and points. Uh, as it pertains to at least DraftKings points. Uh, but your scoring may be different, uh, but the players' names are, I think, what you should take away from it and what you should feel uh, that you should be paying attention to are the, are the names that are, that are cycling. And, and you'll hear a lot of them, especially as the weeks go by and these players turn into either really good players or they drop off the face of the earth. Because here's the thing. One week, and I tweeted this out earlier, one week is not a trend. One week is an occurrence. So we have to see this over two or three weeks. So if we get excited about a name and all of a sudden they don't perform for the rest of the season, that's bound to happen, right? Or if we sleep on a name and then all of a sudden they blow up in week three. The thing about fantasy football, and if you're new to it, then I'm sorry you just ruined your life. But really, the, the whole thing is that you you have to understand that in fantasy football, and uh, my my guest has said it time and time again in Matthew Barry, he says, you take the range of outcomes that are most likely to happen and you play from there, right? Obviously, there's going to be outliers every week of people that perform way above expectations, people that perform way below expectations. And so you just have to ride that median and and sort of, uh, you know, live by it and die by it because it, this is a game where it's frustrating. And of course, everywhere, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You, Everybody can say, oh, I totally called that. Well, yeah, okay. But if you make enough predictions, if all you do is make predictions all week long about every single player, chances are you're going to get some right. And chances are you're going to get some wrong. So, you know, again, just take every piece of advice you hear from anybody, including myself, with a grain of salt, especially in the beginning of this season, uh, because we still are learning. Everybody's still learning. These players are still learning systems. These players are still moving around some. You know, there, there's players that have been dropped in the last couple of days. There's players that have been added in the, in the last couple of days. And we'll talk about one of them uh, coming up in our three to grab section. So, uh, all right, let's do this. Three up. Three players that performed well above what I think anybody expected them to, uh, and and then we'll go to the three down. But three up, P.J. Walker. Okay, 
Now, this one may not be that much of a surprise because everybody, I think, uh, had some sort of expectations. But I don't. I didn't hear very many people banging the drum for PJ Walker. And if you are, cool. Give me a tweet at fantasy uh, XFL Fantasy Cast uh, and let me know you were one of the ones on PJ Walker because I want to follow you so I can get all of your good fantasy knowledge as well. Uh, but PJ Walker, the Houston quarterback, man, that guy came on and and had himself a game. He was twenty three at thirty nine, two hundred and seventy two yards, four touchdown passes uh an amazing quarterback performance in his his first game of the xfl season uh he did throw a pick but um I mean, whatever, four, four touchdown passes is still a great performance. Uh, he did add four rushes for 26 yards to his game. And the thing about P.J. Walker is that I, I think I might have tweeted this or I might have just told somebody that I was watching the game with, but moves a lot like Lamar Jackson, you know, and, and one of those guys where I'm not saying that he's elusive as, as elusive as Lamar Jackson, but he looks like he can, if, if he gets enough reps and if he can play enough games and, you know, if he can stay healthy, um, he looks like he could be a very dominant, XFL quarterback if uh, if he can just get himself situated in the scheme and uh, you know he'll he'll do some good things and he already did some great things in the first game uh, but if you played him on DraftKings, you got 34.48 points out of him uh, good for the top spot at the quarterback position uh, for the week in DraftKings and you know the thing about it was that there was so many people that were on other folks um, you know, he was actually, he was over 20% owned, over 25% owned, actually, P.J. Walker was. So it was a, a fair amount. Uh, the split between him and Cardero Jones was was pretty big. Uh, but I still think that, uh, you know, because of the quarterback news that had come out earlier, that's why more people ended up on P.J. Walker. Um, and, and I mean, it's the reason why I ended up playing P.J. Walker in, in a couple of my tournaments, too, uh, because I didn't really trust anybody else other than my Brandon Silver's love. He's not even in our three down section because I I just didn't uh, I don't think enough people were on him I I just I don't know I held on to this unhealthy uh, absolute obsession with with Brandon Silver's was going to be the giant breakout star <laughs> of the week uh, Brandon but that's okay I mean there's still the rest of the season I know he may not start uh, and he's he's injured right now but uh, you know eh, I I still have hope for my Brandon Silver's I, I, it'll happen I promise. No, okay, maybe not. Anyways, so the next uh, the next player in our three up section is James Butler. Wow, the running back out of Houston. Where the heck did James Butler come from? Uh, the guy just came and stole this show. Uh, it was amazing to me to to see um, him just break out the way he did. Uh, two touchdowns, one through the air, one on the ground, uh, and he just outshined uh, guys like Williams and Henderson, who were supposed to be the guys that were there and and were the ones that are uh, were supposed to be the guys that uh, that were going to carry the rock for Houston. Uh, but here comes James Butler, right? Thirty yards on the ground with the touchdown, two receptions for twenty point or uh, twenty yards rather, uh, and a touchdown, an even nineteen points in. DraftKings uh, and definitely led him to the top of the leaderboard uh, for the DraftKings contests. And, you know, the thing about it is that uh, everybody else that was that was out there that was rostered, um, you know, he was 0.01% owned. Just going to let that sink in for you. 0.01% owned. I went looking and digging and absolutely trying to find uh, an instance of James Butler and nobody, none of the top any lineups uh, had James Butler. I mean, I, I went about 200 down and, and looked to see if anybody played James Butler. Nobody in the top 200 played James Butler. So um, that's why I asked for the screenshot on Twitter. I was like, can you please show me where a James Butler was played? Because I want to see <laughs> where James Butler was played. But hey, listen, Big ups, big, huge ups. And and if this is not a Twitter account you're following, make sure you head down and follow it right now. Um, Alex McKinnon, he's tweeting at Alex McKinnon XFL. That's A-L-E-X. M C K I N N O N X F L. Uh, the man broke down the entire ownership of uh, the guys on DraftKings for the main slate, and he's doing God's work. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I really, honestly wish I had the time <laughs> to compile stats, uh, but I don't, and he does, and I'm so pleased and happy that he, he can for us. So um, I'm getting most of my ownership percentage stats from him uh, and, and DraftKings ones for the ones that I could. And find so uh, 
uh, again, thanks, Alex, if you're listening. Um, I, I certainly am going to give you all the props in the world for uh, being the man in the trenches and digging up these stats. Uh, so anyways, so yeah, Butler was a guy that uh, that really came through for some one person, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> two? I don't even know what, how to break down that percentage. But for the one or two of you that played him, you probably didn't cash, but you probably felt like a genius after that. Uh, so yeah, definitely. And I know that that's going to be a hot waiver wire ad. It's not one of the ones in my three to grab because I'm going to talk I talk about him here. Uh, but if he's out there on your waiver wire, you might want to pick him up and stash him depending on how deep your bench is. Um, you know, in the conversation I just had with uh, with Matthew Barry, he's got a two person bench and he'll tell you the rest of it later, but he's only got two people, uh, two bench spots. So that's going to be difficult to try to grab some of these guys that I'm telling you to grab. If you've only got two, uh, maybe you've got four, maybe you've got six on your bench. So you've got to be very judicious with, with your bench. If you've only got four even. Um, so make sure you're spending that, that, uh, those waiver claims wisely when you're, when you're going to pick stuff up. Now look at James Butler may have been a flash in the pan. We don't know. Um, would I roster him again in, in one or two of my contests? Sure. Because why the heck not? I mean, it'd, it'd be kind of dumb to not. I mean, obviously, his ownership percentage next week's now going to be 0.01. <laughs> I'll tell you that much right now. It'll bump up quite a bit. Uh, it'll be people chasing points, which, I mean, again, it, you probably should put one or two. And, and this depends on also how many rosters you, you, you float out there, how many lineups you float out there um, on DraftKings, on FanDuel. If you're a person that plays 150, you know, if you play the max entries, yeah, you're going to have some exposure to James Butler. It's just, you're going to have to do it for 150 lineups. Um, but if you play one or two or even three, uh, you might want to maybe head yourself and, and maybe just play James in a lower uh, GPP, a lower price, you know, that way you don't lose a ton of money if he doesn't, uh, if he doesn't go off or if you're putting four or five or six lineups in a multi, a multi entry, um, you know, maybe one lineup has them in it and then, you know, a couple, you, you go the other way, but, uh, you know, it's just a matter of, of how many lineups you're playing and how much exposure you want to a guy that could very well not get into the end zone at all next week. Uh, and we can say that with just about everybody on this list, maybe with the exception of PJ Walker, because you know PJ Walker is going to probably turn in a pretty good performance again uh, this coming week. So uh, that's not too much of a. I guess risk to take, but again, the risk you take in PJ Walker now that he blow he blew up is that everybody's going to want to play him, and his ownership percentage will be higher than the you know twenty six twenty eight that he was um, this last week. So again, this is DFS, man. This is the risk we take. If you're in season long, you're starting PJ Walker. It's not even a question, right? PJ Walker's in your lineup. Don't even think about it. Just leave him there. Don't try to get cute. Just play PJ Walker, uh, especially if you're in an eight team league, because that's all you got. You know, you ain't going to go uh, and, and pick up a flowers if he's still available. And if he's made a running back slash quarterback um, on the off chance that that happens. But uh, yeah, anyways. Uh, all right. So we've already gone PJ Walker, James Butler. The third up uh, is Austin Proel. man, that guy, I, he just came out of nowhere. I really honestly came out of nowhere. Five receptions, 88 yards, two touchdowns, good for 26.1 DraftKings points. Um, and, you know, again, if you if you drafted him, good on you. If you didn't, then you're probably not alone. I don't think a lot of people saw a, a guy like Proel jumping out to that big of a start in the season. Um, and he really, he just, he came on strong and he, he never let up for, for Seattle uh, in a, in a, you know, game where they really needed somebody to come out and, and do that. Um, the next leading receiver for the Dragons was Dantes Bird. He only had two receptions for 32 yards. Um, you know, it, it just there was nobody catching the ball but Proel. Uh, he had the five receptions on 10 targets. So, you know, Silvers was looking his way early and often. Um, until he got hurt, but even BJ didn't come in and do anything. Uh, he did absolutely nothing. BJ Daniels did. So it was all silvers to pro. So, you know, that pro L is silvers favorite target while he's in there. Now with the injury report that silvers is, is on the injured list. Uh, what does that do? Who knows now at this point? Cause BJ Daniels is the backup. But we haven't seen enough out of him on the field yet to actually know who his receivers of choice is going to be. And it may not be Proel. It may be Dantes Bird. Uh, we never know. So keep an eye on that situation. I, I'm not sure that anybody really wants to um, 
jump headlong into that uh, Seattle situation this week. Uh, you know, again, last week it was it was a good situation if you had Proel, but uh, if you didn't, then uh, it wasn't a good situation. And again, we don't know. We don't know what's going on with that team. And once we find out more, I think we'll be uh, we'll be just fine. All right. So that's the three up. Let's go ahead and move to our three down. In fact, let, uh, hold on real quick. So Proel was 5.36% owned. So again, not a lot of people were on him. And, uh, and again, if you did have them, then most of the, actually most of the winning lineups actually did have, uh, some sort of pro L or spruce in there. Uh, cause spruce was right on his tail with 24.3 points on the day, but he wasn't one of our three ups because pro L stole the show. Uh, all right. So uh, a bonus up actually, before we even move on some more is the New York DST. Whoo boy. Defensive touchdowns, sacks, interceptions, fumble recoveries, the whole nine good for 24 points, man. That was probably one of the best plays that I had of the week. Uh, was my my Guardians defense pick, uh, and that was that was a lot of fun to watch them go off. So there's your bonus up uh, for for the day. Uh, all right, our three down. <laughs> These poor guys. It leads off with Sammy Coates, the receiver for Houston. Two receptions, 26 yards, good for 4.6 DraftKings points. Sammy, man, everybody was in on Sammy all season long. Everybody was talking about Sammy. In fact, 51.23% of the main lineups in DraftKings had Sammy Coates in them. So that goes to tell you that everybody with name recognition, I told you about it when we first talked about uh, playing these games and playing it. It's name recognition, right? Sammy Coates. Everybody thought Sammy Coates was going to come in and just dominate. And, and you know, he didn't. He came in. He had two catches. <laughs> he had uh, uh, 26 yards on those two catches. So it wasn't a, an actual huge dominant performance. So this is why I cautioned you about name recognition and, and, and actually um, – being very weary of the folks that are, are huge names, uh, which uh, the next one on our list is as well. The third uh, three down is Cameron Otters Payne, right? Dallas running back. Just totally not used at all, to be honest with you. Two, two carries for six yards, and he caught or he threw a pass for 10 yards. So that counted as a point as well. Where he actually did anything was in the receiving game where he had four receptions for 13 yards, but all of that only equaled 6.3. DraftKings points. Now, here's the thing about uh, uh, Cap, I guess, is everybody's. Uh, here's the thing about uh, Artis Payne, though, is that he uh, he was in the midst of, of most of the running backs uh, because there was not a lot of dominant running back performances this week. Uh, short of Butler and Trey Williams, uh, you know, everybody else was sort of middle of the pack. Uh, and and even, even Lance Dunbar came in and did something, but everybody else was under double digits. You know, the Davion Smiths, the Ken Kenneth Farrows, uh, the Hollies, all these guys were all, Jarrell Presley even was only at 6.9 points. So this wasn't a, a huge running back week, uh, but even in a not so huge running back week, uh, Cameron Otis Payne just did not deliver at all. Uh, he didn't kill you completely, uh, but he certainly didn't help you win like a James Butler did. And then last but not least on the third down, uh, on the three down, is, is Kristen Michael, which if you watch the games, if you played fantasy, if you played C, uh, uh, DFS, you absolutely know 100% what I am about to say and that he did nothing, nothing. Seven carries for no yards. He had one reception for negative one yards, good for a negative point one performance. Uh, and, and boy, it was a frustrating day, uh, on the ground for Kristen Michael and that, uh, the battle Hawks offense. Uh, so, I mean, again, that was another one where everybody came in and they were all in on, on, uh, Kristen Michael to the tune of what was he at? He was at 20.46% owned in the main. So not a huge, I mean, but that's a huge ownership share when you consider that, you know, most everybody else was, it was under, under 20. Uh, Jarrell Presley was the highest uh, next owned next to Cameron artist paying at 29.7. So, uh, you know, Kristen Michael came in pretty highly owned and everybody was, was putting a lot of faith that he was going to get it done. Uh, but he did not for the battle Hawks. 
So, yeah, I mean, Matt Jones, or Matt Jones, yeah, was the one that came in and actually did anything on the ground. 21 rushes for 85 yards. Uh, so it, I know he's owned, which is why he's not really on the pickup uh, list. Uh, he's pretty well owned. People were picking him up. So, But if you started him or if you put him in your DraftKings lineup, uh, you're, you're actually pretty happy because uh, he got you some actual points where Christian, Christian Jones did not. Um, and Matt Jones was not even that high owned. Uh, he was 1.48% owned. He got you 8.5 points. So a little bit better than Cameron Artis Payne, but not as good as a Trey Williams or a uh, James Butler. So, uh, all right, that's the three up. That's the three down. Here's three to grab. All right, here's the ones to keep on the waiver wire uh, list for you. If, if your waiver wire is going to process tomorrow or, or you know, earlier today, uh, here, here's some three to grab. Uh, keep SJ Green on your radar. All right, the uh, the Dragons just picked him up uh, off of the Canadian Football League uh, situation. And here's the thing about SJ Green. All right, he's a Grey Cup champ. He's a future Hall of Famer in the Canadian Football League. The dude's got over 10,000 yards, so many catches, so many touchdowns. Um, that he is just a phenomenal talent, right? He's he's over 30, so he's on the older side of it. And the reason that this is this gets into a whole uh thing that I'm I'm going to I'm not going to go too far on because I, I want you to understand that not everybody is coming over because of of all kinds of craziness. But so SJ Green just he he demanded too much of a of a um a salary in the in the CFL because of his accolades because of everything he's just too expensive to stay there now and he decided he wanted to give the xfl a shot uh and 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 see what he could do in the xfl uh he has nothing left to prove in the cfl i'll tell you that much right now so he's coming over i think purely just to see what he can do over here in the states uh and and, and you know what on friday's show i'm going to talk a lot more about the whole uh you know process of of canadian football and some of these other football leagues and and how they correlate with the xfl but just keep in mind sj green is a name to put on your waiver wire list and uh in the, in a couple of weeks he's he's a guy that you're going to probably want to roster uh on your dfs rosters quite a bit so uh all right cam phillips is another one the houston wide receiver uh where all eyes were elsewhere cam phillips uh grabbed some some good uh attention he had four receptions for 67 yards and a touchdown good for 16.7 points uh receiving so that's that's a good Good performance for Cam Phillips. And then last but not least, keep on your radar, Dan Williams, the Tampa Bay wide receiver. He had six receptions for 123 yards. He was the blown bright spot in that just horrendous Tampa Bay offensive performance. Uh, And so you definitely want to keep your eyes on him and see if he can uh, follow up on that performance and, uh, and, and, and do great things. So, all right, those are your three to grab. We, we talked about three up, three down, three to grab. Let's get on with the rest of the show because I got to tell you, the rest of it is amazing. And uh, you're going to hear Matthew Berry in in a few short minutes. So, uh, all right, let's get on with the rest of the show. I'm joined today by David Behrman. He is the deputy editor of sports betting at ESPN.com, a man that knows where to put his money, and he has put his money on the XFL, and we are all glad for it. David, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Exciting weekend with the XFL launching, and uh, it was good to see. It looked like it was a successful first weekend, and I know uh, our ABC ratings were good on Saturday, and uh, it seemed like a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Now, okay, look, I know it was a lot of fun for me because I barely had a little bit of money on this, but you are a better. You are a man that tells people where to put their money. How was it for you to experience it? Uh, football in February, first of all, and, and a brand new league. What was that like for you? Well, having it in February is fantastic. It, it fills one of those voids where you know, the NFL and the college football season are over and the Bulls are done and Super Bowl is over. And they're like, all right, yeah, you can dabble with you know, NBA and NHL and all that. But at the end of the day, it's where, the, where you make your money is on you know, playing football games. And it's interesting and scary at the same time because you would call this like a soft new market that there's not many people out there who really, really know. And I'm not going to even pretend to tell you that I'm an expert when it comes to these teams. It's rosters, it's coaches, it's you make your handicapping based on what you haven't seen yet, which can be a scary thing because you go out there and, and give the picks and give your analysis and you could be 100% wrong or 100% right. Um, so it's a little bit scary, but at the same time, it's one of those leagues where you have to dig for the information, you have to study the rosters. And I always joke about the NFL. If, you, if you're betting the NFL on Sunday, you already lost. 
<laughs> because everybody else bet into the market. The lines already moved around from where the where the pros and the public has done. And by the time you get to Sunday, if you're betting it, you're you're done. You might as well not do it because in the NFL, you got to get there and beat the market. Uh, XFL, you, you really don't know what to expect. Uh, it was heavy, heavy action for for sharps, not so much public, which I think will change over time. But uh, it was fun to at least have something to watch and give out. And, and I was I was I was as honest as can be when I when I gave my picks out on um, on Twitter and at DB One Sports. I said, listen, take this with a grain of salt. We haven't seen one play of action yet. We don't haven't seen any of the new rules, the kickoff rules, the two minute rules. So I'm going to give you what I think based on what I've seen from the rosters and the, the talent pool. And I did pretty well week one, which was great. Um, you, just, you just never know when, it, when a new league starts up. You know, it makes me happy to hear professionals say that, especially professionals in the DFS industry and the sports betting industry, because there's so many people that bang their chest and say, oh yeah, you have to pick my picks because I know everything. And yet we don't, this is all a game of chance. You could do all the research in the world. And then, uh, you know, a, a guy that, that was heavily touted going into it is going to you know, pull up and, and not do anything. A Philip Nelson who was going to supposedly do okay in Landry Jones's uh, absence is going to not put the ball in the end zone. Yeah, and you, you look no further than the late game yesterday, the St. Louis Dallas game, where you had two former NFL running backs that were supposed to. They were, if you looked at the the DFS and the the fantasy leagues, they were two of the top five picks in the draft in Artis Payne and and uh, Shin Michael. And they did nothing combined, nothing. And they were basically relegated to second and third string for the whole game. And it wasn't like these teams were scoring 40 and 50 points in that game either. They just weren't used. So you really don't know what the coaches are thinking. You know what how Mummy's offense was going to do, and they did what you expected and dumped it here and dumped it there and dumped it there. Just it was Dunbar and it was Artis Payne. And, you know, you had Matt Jones running on the other side. So you really don't know what to expect. And, and I appreciate you saying that about admitting what we do and do not know. I saw plenty of handicappers over the weekend say, you have to take Seattle plus eight. It's the lock of the century. And I'm like, really? The lock of a century on a team that you haven't seen one play of action yet. You just, you just can't do that. And I was like, yes, it's a grain of salt. Now, I'm not one that bets much NFL preseason or baseball spring training because you just the unknown out there. They're exhibitions. They're really not playing for anything. In this case, it's a league. It's a professional football league. These games do matter. They do count. So I have no problem getting in there and betting it. You just have to realize that you, you only know what you know. And, and to be honest, I did a fantasy draft on Friday night for three hours. And when I was done with the three-hour obnoxiously long draft in the Google Doc, because there's no other way to do it, um, I had the rosters pretty darn set. And if you look at my fantasy team and the bets I gave out, there's a lot of correlation there. <laughs> I took the New York defense and thought the New York defense was going to be good and bet on New York. I took a couple of Houston players and thought Houston was going to be good and gave it out and Houston was good. So, you know, I, I devalued Tampa Bay and Tampa Bay didn't play well. So a lot of the bets that I handicapped are based on the rosters that I did for the fantasy and you could, I could have been wrong on both ends. I had a good first weekend, but you never know going forward. Oh, I mean, you have to take no no longer look than at my actual season-long fantasy roster to say, wow, this guy. <laughs> you know, if there's yeah. a miss, there's a there's every... Well, I mean, I maybe got one guy right, but everybody else was just... I mean, you know, I, I, I did a lot of research and... We're so biased sometimes in our research that when we when we start going down a rabbit hole, we think, oh, yeah, this is gold. And then we, we convince ourselves of that. And then when we go into it armed with the knowledge that we know, uh, sometimes we we're blinded ourselves to other stuff. So, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, and, you, and I always compared fantasy and gambling in two different fronts. Like, you know, people would completely disagree with me that one is more of a crapshoot than the other. And, like, I think with betting – you can study game plans and coaches and expected point values and get a pretty good feel of how a game's going to do. But fantasy wise, you're not in the locker room when the coach decides the two deeps and who he's going to use when. And you just, I call it the Bill Belichick. You have no idea what running back that guy's going to use on any freaking day. Is he going to pass the ball 60 times and, and use his running back for six carries? Or is he going to, you know, run, run the ball right down the middle with LeGarrette Blunt and never throw the ball? You just don't really know what the game plans are. And that affects what you're doing with betting and fantasy. And, you know, nobody expected a, a team with Bob Stoops and Hal Mummy to be held to three field goals. And that's what happened. So you make an interesting uh, uh, comparison between fantasy and betting. And, and I'll be honest with you, completely honest with you. But sports betting has always scared me because I just I feel like like you just said, like it's more of a crapshoot. But I know that it's not. So 
when you talk about sports betting, let's talk about some of the factors of it and what you can bet and what's out there right now. I know that I've seen that some lines on the championship have actually changed since uh, week one, and which they should, I'm so. But let, let's talk about the world of sports betting for those who aren't really necessarily um, involved in it that heavy. What, is it, what does it mean to be a sports better? Sure. It's sports betting to me, I and mean, there's a certain talent to it. You also have a certain amount of, obviously, you know, luck involved with how the games go. But when in terms of handicapping games, you could look at the sides of the, of the game, you know, the plus minuses of who's favored with the point spread. You could take the money line straight up, a team to win outright, which would have paid dividends yesterday with St. Louis and uh, New York, who are both underdogs and getting two and three to one on the money line. Or you can look at the totals, you know, the over-unders, how many points are going to be scored. And I thought that was – the biggest misnomer of the weekend was you really didn't know how the new rules were going to affect the totals. So I gave out the picks, but I didn't bet the totals. I bet the sides in all four games because I had a pretty good feel of who's going to be better and missed last night's game but hit the first three. Um, but you, you can also do player props, and it's not out yet for XFL, but for the NFL and college football, there are a lot of player props, which is very similar to fantasy where you're actually projecting what a player is going to do. Instead, you have direct money on that player as opposed to a whole fantasy team or DFS team. And I, I for one, love them all, but I prefer the, the art of the sports betting because you can sit here and handicap games by themselves, a whole roster versus a roster, as opposed to putting together your own mini roster that has no correlation to each other. Like who you put at quarterback in, in your fantasy team versus your running back, there, there's no correlation between the two if they're on different teams, whereas there is when you're actually placing a wager on a game. It's one game. Everything matters in that single game. So that's where I see the biggest difference. Whereas your fantasy team could be good or bad, but it's depending on eight different factors if you have eight different players. Yeah, uh, that's great. And so you got a little more control over what you are are putting your money on when it comes to betting. It sounds like, and that you can pick and choose uh, exactly where your money goes. <clears throat> Again, versus like a DraftKings lineup where you're right, you're you're spending I don't know maybe fifteen dollars on a on an entry fee. And you have to make sure that all eight of those players perform, whereas you put $15 on an over-under on, let's say, Kristen Michaels' uh, yardage total. And if you bet the under, then you already won whatever the, the odds were, right? Right. Yeah, you're basically more concentrated on direct win or loss as opposed to you know, daily fantasy. You have eight different players or seven different players, depending on what pool you're in. And you're going up against all the other players who are in the, you know, all the other teams that are in the thing. And you have to worry about that, which you can't control, whereas in betting, you don't control the action that's on the field, but you control what you're betting on. And it's more of a singular data point of I'm betting this total, this over under uh, this side, or, and one thing I didn't bring up before was a future, like the future wagers on, you know, when you want to jump in on, like if you had jumped in on Houston, which I did before week one, I got them at six to one. They're now the favorite at three and a half to one to win the league title. Again, who knows? There's still nine more weeks to go, but like St. Louis was, eight to one and now they're four to one. So depending on it's a strategy of when to jump in on it. And the same thing with the betting line. The, you know, if you had gotten in on the over unders at 40 and a half, which is when they posted, you, you got ahead of the game when they went all the way up to 51 and 52. And some of them hit the middle. Whereas if you waited till the very end, if you wanted to bet an under, they were all in the fifties, you bet the under and the score was 12, nine. So there's a definite art and strategy to when you get in and out of a bet. And then there's the whole in-game wagering, which would take a whole nother show to discuss. But that's also stuff that it's playing like playing a day trading with the stock market when you get in and out of a game. And I, I just I have a better feel for controlling that as I do a fantasy lineup, which you're competing against everybody else in your league or everybody else in your pool. And by the way, there are eight different units there that may all do different. And all it takes is one player to do crappy and you're not going to win. Yeah, like a Kristen Michael. <clears throat> Negative on my point, on my bench. It, yeah, on my lineup, it was it was horrible. If he would have done anything, and I mean anything, I would have at least cashed that week. So, huh, <laughs> I'm telling you. So let me let me ask you because I'm curious. How does one get into uh, a, a place like ESPN uh, and dealing with sports betting? Sure. Well, my original background was in TV and radio, doing play by play and and doing radio shows and and stuff like yourself. Uh, I was working in minor league baseball for a while, doing uh, play-by-play and media relations for minor league baseball, and it led to eventually a researcher job, stats and researcher job opening here at ESPN back in 2005, so it's been about 15 years. And I started in our stats and info department, basically producing stats for games and notes for games for games and broad and uh, shows. So every live show you see on ESPN, whether it be Sports Center, NFL Live, Baseball Tonight, or College Game Day, 
every show has a researcher. And for those who watch College Game Day and see Krista Bear Felica, who has now become a talent on the show, pushing betting and, 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 and sports game, and betting and gambling, he's a researcher on that show as well. So that's the type of stuff that we were doing when I started. I worked my way up in, into management and, and managed different aspects of the department, but also created a group at ESPN that concentrated on sports betting content. And I'll stress the content part because it's not like we had our own, you know, we weren't our own sports book. We were pushing the content for the different shows, which four, five, six years ago, it wasn't really popular and people really weren't paying attention because it was illegal in, those, in all states but Nevada. The PASPA law being overturned by the Supreme Court a year and a half ago is what kind of changed the tide for all of us where it was okay. Now sports betting is going to become legal in state after state after state, you know, up to 13 states now and projection is to have 20 to 22 states by the end of 2020 that we're going to need to have a more of a bigger group of people at ESPN that handle sports betting. And I oversee uh, Chalk, which is the digital website, ESPN.com backslash Chalk. And I oversee the editorial content on that and, and work with the TV side, which I was on for 14 years before moving over to digital and helping launch Daily Wager, which is on six days a week on ESPN2. And having a, an official show and dedicated website to sports betting content. We're not a tout service. We're not a book. But we create content around sports betting, which just like a couple of years ago, Daily Fantasy was popular. And years before that, fantasy became popular and analytics became popular. Those are always waves of things that become popular. You just got to prepare yourself that you're going to you know, be involved with that when that comes around. Boy, you sound like you just had yourself in the right position every time to move forward. So <laughs> that's awesome. And and there's a lot of people that are listening out here right now that uh, really want to be the next you. And so uh, that's got to be a little humbling, huh? <laughs> It is humbling. I do thank myself every day that I have a job that I go to work with that I enjoy, that I love, and producing content for things that, you know, that it's a different thing every single day, but it's still the area that I want to be in. And for a while, I was overseeing a whole bunch of different sports, more you like some more than others, um, in different aspects of, of the company. And, and now this, this one role is concentrating on the growth of sports betting, which I'm very, very happy with. So when you looked out on the landscape of Twitter and, and all the sports betting and all the stuff that you, you saw out there, how... I, I, I don't really know how to phrase it. How accurate or how much should we uh, uh, be paying attention to some of the, the books out there that uh, the folks that are giving advice? Because I know, like you said, in the unknown, it's difficult to know who to trust. So what did you see as a collective out there in the Twitter sphere? I would say in the Twitter sphere over the weekend that, that people were prominently right on the teams. I wasn't the only one who hit three out of the four games in terms of we all missed that Dallas should have played better, but again, they're missing Landry Jones. But I think we all expected Houston to play well. Um, I was one of the few who thought New York would beat Tampa, which is why New York was the underdog at home. But I liked their defense a lot and really didn't trust the Tampa offense. Uh, I think where people missed the most was the totals. And it's week one, and people are obsessing over the new rules, which are interesting and fun. But at the end of the day, if I learned anything from doing the same exact exercise with the AAF a year ago, you still need players and players to score touchdowns. And there was an abundance of bad plays during some of key moments in the games yesterday and, and Saturday and coaching decisions. And this is not the National Football League. It's a, you know, a different league. And whereas I thought it was fun and, and, and it was you know, different you still have to remember it's not the NFL and there are going to be coaching mistakes and player mistakes and issues that any team would have in the first game of the season, which is why I thought the whole, the new rules are going to make these 50 to 40 games was a little bit overblown. Three of the four went under the total and the fourth one barely went over the total. So, and then again, the first one should have gone over had they not pulled the field goal off the board. So it could have gone either way, but the other two games went under the total by a lot. <laughs> You know, it's 12-9 in the total 52 and a half. So I think that's one thing where if you were paying attention in the Twitter world, a lot of people were touting points, 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 and more points, which is why the lines went from 40 and a half to the 50s. You have to sit back and say, the starting quarterback is still, you know, God bless them, but Philip Nelson. And the starting quarterback is Landry Jones next week. And you're talking about um, Andrew Murray, who got benched in the AAF. He's about to get potentially benched again in the XFL. So, you know, you watch Andy Murray and you're like, all right, this is not the NFL. <laughs> and Andy Murray might have been a good college quarterback, but he hasn't played very well in the, his professional days. And it's why Tampa only scored three points. You know, it, it, you have to remember that 
these players are still here for a reason and go easy on the totals. Yeah, when you get benched for Matt Sims and you know you lose your job there in the AAF, it's not it doesn't lend itself to another chance, I think, but uh yeah, anyways. Right. Are you encouraged at all by the, by how the XFL is actually incorporating and I know they said they were making a kind of a big deal out of the sports betting and and I think Again, not being a sports better myself, I don't know how how impressive it was that the over under was listed on the on the uh, scoring bug. But uh, is, is that anything for you to, to get excited about? A hundred percent excited, and I would say that was the, the biggest takeaway for me. Even though I knew it was coming, because I actually had many many conversations with the XFL and our production teams here about how to how this would be displayed. It, it, it's the first of its kind, which is what makes it exciting. Here is. You know, we show NFL games. You don't see that on Monday Night Football. You don't see that on CBS or Fox or NBC. It's not allowed. And, and whereas the NBA is a little bit more um, flexible when it comes to gambling talk, it's still not something you see in the broadcast. You don't see it on TV. You might see it in our shows. But the XFL has embraced gambling talk, gambling graphics. And it wasn't just having the line in the over-under on the broadcast. The minute they took the field goal off the board – um, with the Seattle team, all of a sudden, like when they kicked the field goal, they're covering and it's the over. Once they take it off, it was still up in the air. And when they fumbled the five yard line, that was something that the, the game was, I believe, uh, was it a 12 point game at the time? Them fumbling may have decided the game right then and there, but the total and the point spread were still in flux for the next six or eight minutes, which is something where, as a fan of the game, and a, a friend of mine is a, fr- is a fan of football, but is not a sports better at all. He stuck around because he was intrigued by the fact that the total and the side were still part of the game with two minutes to go, even though the game was over. Uh, same thing with the total in the, in the Houston game, whereas it was a you know an 18-point game, but it hadn't been decided yet. So there are ways where the broadcast can keep fans interested in the same way that you're a fantasy guy, right? So – there's going to be garbage points scored by your quarterback who's down two touchdowns. And that receiver that you had that caught the touchdown late in the game when his team was down 18 points means nothing to the game, but it helps your fantasy team. That is the same type of thing we're trying to get across at gambling is the game's really never over until it's over. So the fact that you can still have a gambling component to this and they're showing it and talking about it on the broadcast is completely new and exciting. You, your enthusiasm has just made me want to actually jump into sports betting because, man, the passion that you have behind that. And, and listen, so on that end, let's say there's there's people that are trying to that are listening that are fantasy people, but they they really do feel like they want to dip their toes into um, this sports betting world. What's the best way for somebody who's never done this before? What what's the easiest? I want to say easiest, but what's the the less intimidating thing to do in order to jump into this world? Well, I mean, it was a selfish plug. I would say go to ESPN.com backslash chalk, which is where we're going to have um, every single Wednesday and Friday. We have NBA picks columns, and there we're going to potentially start XFL ones, and we've done NFL and college ones throughout the entire football season. I would say read, read, and read, and if you want to actually play something, start out small with saying, okay, I normally have this team over this team. Do I really think this team is three or four points better than this team? And pick a side. Pick one. Don't worry about the totals yet because you have no idea how, how these leagues are going to are going to work. But pick a side of the game that you think is going to win and maybe just bet it with the money line and you think just win or loss or lay the points and have some fun with it at low levels. And you can't really bet a lot right now with the XFL anyway. Um, but that's one way to play it. Or, you know, play the future market and put a little coin on – taking a Houston or a St. Louis to win the whole thing and watch them all year long, just like you would your fantasy team. So I'd say there's plenty of ways to have fun with it. Or if they do come out with player props, just like you would do in fantasy is grab a player prop or two and, and, and root for that player to do well, just like you would in fantasy. Where's the best place to play? Depends on what state you're in, quite honestly, (laughs) (laughs) if it's legal in the state. I mean, if you're, if you're in Nevada, it could be anywhere. If you're in New Jersey, it could be anywhere. If you're in states like California and Connecticut, you have to not admit that you're doing it where it's not legal. So um, I would say that if you're in a state that's legal, any sort of Caesars, MGM, uh, FanDuel, or DraftKings are places that will give you the most options. 
Outstanding. All right. Well, then we won't get any anybody in trouble because uh, I'd like everybody to be con- to listen to this uh, outside of the confinement of a prison. So, uh, yeah, absolutely, man. Okay, this has been a lot. This has been great, and I think uh, some of the folks that come here for fantasy um, have been introduced to an entirely new world um, where I think uh, I'm going to actually try. I'm going to I'm going to dip my toes into whatever because I think fan uh, uh, DraftKings has some sort of uh, sports book, right? So, yep. DraftKings has a sports book. FanDuel has one. Uh, Caesars, MGM, or the uh, points bet. If you're in Pennsylvania, those are the, the key places that you know, have legalized sports betting and have taken advantage of that with with the markets out there. And even if you decide not to place the bet anywhere, you can still. I guess the safest way to do it and dip your toe in is to look at the point spreads and look at the totals and pick them, even without putting money on the table. Just pick them for yourself. Like you know, get in a pool with your buddy, you know, a, a betting pool, and say, hey, I'm going to pick these four sides and these four totals you're going to pick these four sides and these four totals and whoever gets the most right gets lunch or something like that just to have the action on the game without necessarily being able to put money on it if you can't because of either finances or you're in a state that's not legal um other places to get information i I said earlier but at db1 sports is my my twitter handle and i send out information daily on stuff that content that espn is pitching and just like you earlier today i put the uh, the odds out with the new odds are to to win the XFL title, according to, to Caesars, who we have a deal with. Yeah, I was going to say, you tweeted me earlier when we were messaging back and forth to set this up. Uh, you were like, well, I got a big meeting with Caesars, so uh, I'm going to have to, you know, <laughs> let you. And so, <laughs> again, it's the whole thing. And we're like, yeah, you, you never think to ever hear that in your life. Well, hold on, I got a, I got a meeting with Caesars, so you, you're just going to have to hold on, little podcast guy. <laughs> uh, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just so thrilled that you joined the show. I really am because again, the the amount of community that we can build around this XFL can only help everybody out and open new avenues because again, your your focus hasn't necessarily been XFL, but you know, maybe the next person in line behind you is going to pick up this XFL torch and run with it and and it just sure. it's nothing but great stuff. No, and I appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun, and I think the first week of the XFL was good. And you never know where it's going to go from there. Obviously, you you hope that it sticks around longer than the alliance did. And I think the way it's set up and the the hours and time that it's spent in marketing and ticketing and and promoting it have uh, have proved the very good week one at least. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been, like you said, packaged a lot better than the AAF was. And it, it I know a lot of people were saying that the AAF took its time and it's it got it right. And I think this weekend actually proves that, yes, the AAF rushed it, but the XFL sat back, had some patience, and uh, and, and put out a good product. So um, go bet on it, right? Absolutely. Go have fun. Put some stuff down. It, even if it's a couple of jelly beans here and there. Even if you're just betting a friend dinner, go ahead, go ahead and, and, and pick the four sides next week and whoever gets the most wins. I love it. I love it. And then post your results to, uh, to me and to David on Twitter. Cause we want to see who gets that steak dinner. David, I appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, I know that you have to rush back to go meet with MGM and Caesars and you know, all the, all the fun stuff, but uh, thanks for taking some time out and for talking to us and, and introducing us to sports betting. Absolutely. Uh, anytime. Just let me know. You, you, uh, you know how to reach me and I'll be happy to come on. Absolutely. All right. David Beerman, everybody, you can... Beer, Beerman? You, I, I have beer on the mind because it's a day off. David <laughs> Beerman, everybody, you can follow him on Twitter at DB1 Sports. Thanks again, David. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, normally my next guest would not need entry, any introduction whatsoever because you'd be able to see him, but that's not happening today. So I give you, ladies and gentlemen, the definitive voice of fantasy football and the talented Mr. Roto himself, Matthew Barry. Matthew, I appreciate you spending some time with me today. Rod, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So look, I don't know if you've noticed, but you have energized an entire fantasy football community by taking part in this XFL adventure. So what made you want to take that leap in the first place? Well, first off, it's football, right? It's, it's football. It's fantasy football. We have no NFL, so there's that. The other thing is, is that there's a group of friends of mine that we did, uh, we did an AAF fantasy football league last year, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And so, it's, you know, it's, and if you follow fantasy Twitter at all, it's a lot of names you're familiar with. It's, uh, it's Scott Fish, it's Mike Clay, Jeff Mann, J.J. Zachariasen, Daniel Dott, my co-host on the Fantasy Show on ESPN+. Uh, let's see, uh, Sal Leto. Um, 
uh, there's probably somebody else I'm forgetting. Oh, uh, Ryan McDowell. So it's a little 18 team. So eight team league, and we had a lot of fun. So when the XFL was announced, we were like, well, we gotta we gotta keep the league going. So uh, so all those things, and I think it's just been listen. I think they did the right thing, the XFL, in terms of <clears throat> waiting to launch. Feels like they had a real plan. Feels like you know, look, just from the first week, like it's real football. Is it as good as the NFL? It's not, but it's closer to the NFL than it is away from the NFL. And I think that's a big credit to everyone at the XFL. It was fun to watch. And well, that's my next question was going to be, I mean, you, you took in the whole first week. What were your takeaways from the actual play on the field and the presentation? And what did it feel like that was different than past spring leagues? You know I mean? I think they, a lot of the changes they made to the rules, uh, and I apologize to your listeners. I'm under, I'm battling through a cold. So that's why I might sound a little, uh, nasal, but <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, I mean, I think, listen, the pace of play is obvious, right? That, that was one. I thought the kickoff rule was interesting. The extra point rule, you know, whether you can go for one, two or three and you can't kick an extra point. I think that's fun. So I thought the majority of their rule changes worked in their favor. I thought they were fun. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of the play, uh, you know, I didn't get to watch all of every game. It's clear that, uh, you know, Houston is going to be a lot of fun. June Jones and that, uh, you know, run and shoot. That's going to, that's going to be a really fun team. Uh, some of the guardians, I think, uh, I think the Vipers have their work cut out for them. And for that last game, I was really surprised at, uh, you know, that the renegades under Bob Stoops weren't able to, uh, score more points. That was, been, that was probably the biggest surprise for me week one. Well, I think a lot of us were expecting Landry to get the start, and then when Philip Nilsson came in, it was just a completely different team. So, I don't know, maybe we'll expect to see something different next week if Landry's able to go. But, uh, yeah, I think that did take a lot of fantasy players by surprise because I- I'm telling you, a lot of the Dallas players were highly drafted. And I, I don't know, what does your team actually look like? Are you or What are you looking at? What kind of roster are you staring at right now? So, so my league, as I mentioned, eight-team league, it's PPR. We play a team quarterback. Um so just, again, because of, you know, sort of the AAF and the, the lessons we learned from that league, it's, there's a lot of switching out. And we play team quarterback. We play one running back, one wide receiver, three flex, two bench. So that's our team. That's our sort of roster setup. And uh, my team, uh, I, went, I went with the Dallas quarterback situation. So I'm hoping certainly that Landry comes home because Phil Nelson did not do a great job for me. I have uh, Nagel. Uh, I stack uh, Dallas with uh, with Flynn Nagel. I have my three. I have three running backs. So I have Jarrell Presley, and then I uh, of uh, of the DC defenders, and I uh, backed him up with uh, Donald Pumphrey. I thought Pumphrey would get enough PPR points to be flex worthy most weeks, and that obviously is a handcuff to Presley. And then I also completely read Houston wrong. I I uh, I picked Daniel Henderson. Because I thought he was a better fit than Andre Williams for the June Jones offense, which turned out to be right, except neither of them were. <laughs> they, they didn't use either guy. Um, and then I have uh, I went Khalil Lewis, uh, who had a nice game uh, for uh, for Houston as well. Uh, Colby Pearson uh, of New York had an, I knew he'd had a really nice uh, set of practice, and he paid off with a touchdown in Week One. And then uh, and then finally I have Casey. Jason Williams from Seattle, who was inactive week one. He's hurt, but I think he's the most talented guy on that team as a pass catcher, so hopefully he can get healthy soon. So your week one was kind of a, a swing and then a hit and then a swing and a miss, but who's your opponent, and did you crush him like a grape? My, my opponent was J.J. Zachariason, and I think I barely beat him. <laughs> We're still waiting for the scores uh, to come in, but uh, he had the Tampa – he had Aaron Murray, and uh, so – he, you know, we had the two worst quarterback performances in the league, but luckily, you know, Lewis had a nice game, Nagel had a nice game, and uh, Kobe Pearson had a nice game for me. He had Cam Phillips, who uh, I noticed on Twitter someone referencing the fact that Cam Phillips was only two, one of two players to play 100% of the snaps in week one. So I think Cam Phillips is uh, Daniel Williams is the other one. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, but uh, – JJ had a couple of disappointments. He had Christian Michael, which, you know. Oh, 
Yeah, I had stop him too. <laughs> stop, wait, stop me if you've heard this before. <laughs> Christian Michael disappointed in fantasy. <laughs> yeah, I, and you know what's sad is as a as a fantasy uh, fantasy analysis, and I put that in quotes because I'm nowhere near anywhere you. Uh, you know, I touted Christian Michael uh, pretty much most of the the preseason. Then you know, you go out on a limb. You're like, man, this guy's gonna kill. He's got this experience, got that experience, and then he goes out and he just lays a complete and total egg. And you're like, well, that's that's my prediction. Yeah, it's you know what are you gonna do? There was so much, there was so much news that was unknown about the league, um, uh, you know that was just uh, so, you know that's that's part of it, right? It's just it's, it's always a challenge because like I couldn't even find out the inactives for the for the Renegades Battlehawks game, uh, you know I was trying to figure because I had DFS lineups and I had Nelson in a couple lineups and I was trying to figure out oh do I need to swap him out for Landry Jones if in so just you know, there was just a real lack of information and coverage of the league um, compared to other leagues. So, really a challenge. So then, my question is: because of that lack of information and that that scarcity of actual stats and 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 uh, just basic stuff that you need to know for fantasy, is that why you think that the major players in fantasy daily, the daily side of it, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the season long side of it rather, is that why they didn't kind of dip their toes into this water yet? Are they still waiting to see what's going on? You know, ESPN, Yahoo, those types of platforms that, that already have these season long uh, setups. Is this why they're staying away kind of for this first year? You know, it's a great question, Rod, and I don't have an answer for you. I certainly want to, I wouldn't want to officially speak for ESPN. So no, absolutely not. Yeah. I don't know. So I, I don't know what the decision process was. You know, I can tell you that in general. But I suspect it's the same at ESPN as it is at Yahoo or CBS or NFL or wherever. That you have a limited amount of resources, any company. And so do you devote those resources to building an XFL product, even though there's already the skeleton of it built? We still got to input the names. You still got to, you know, adjust for the scoring. There's still work to be done. Are you doing that? Is it more important to your bottom line to do that or to improve your football game or to make sure baseball is ready for launch? Because that's what they're doing right now. You know, they're working on baseball. They're making sure baseball is ready to launch. And, you know, and, uh, and for us, March Madness, like our tournament challenge game is, you know, our biggest fantasy game. More people play, you know, a bracket game around the NCAA tournament than any other game on our site, including fantasy football. So I think it's just an allocation of resources and how popular is the league going to be? Is it going to stick around, et cetera, et cetera. So I have no inside knowledge of what the decision-making process was, but if I had to guess, it's probably some combination thereof. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I figured the exact same thing. I was saying beforehand, I said, you know, it, it, it's difficult for somebody to to – get information two weeks before the league is supposed to kick off and launch an entire new product. And I knew that no, no huge company was going to take that risk because you, you can't, you know, again, like you said, there's millions of other things to get ready for. And you can't really say, well, if this hits, then we're good. But then if we fall flat on our face, then we just fell flat on our face. And, you know, with established companies like ESPN, like Yahoo, like you said, CBS, you know, those guys, they're not, they're not ready to take that kind of uh, uh, risk with an unknown league, especially, could you imagine if they would have all dived in with the AAF? Exactly. But I will say my belief is that next year there will be at least, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a guy that did it sort of out of the labor love, all fantasy sports. Uh, but my belief is that one of the major providers, assuming the XFL continues the success it had opening weekend and, uh, you know, is coming back next year and there's momentum. I believe somebody will offer a, uh, you know, a commissioner product for it. And certainly DraftKings and FanDuel have, you know, dived right in. Oh, that's a good, and so that's a good point too, because uh, DraftKings and FanDuel, the daily side of it, uh, you, I know you love playing daily fantasy. Did you have fun playing this first week, even though there was so many unknowns? I did. I won money. So, <laughs> yeah, I didn't win a ton of money, but I uh, I won more than I played, so uh, that was good. Uh, I went heavy on uh, Houston. So I, I had a couple of, you know, C.J. Walker, uh, Khalil Lewis stacks, and worked out well. Yeah, I went Philip Nelson because I don't know why. I'm a glutton for punishment, and I thought, well, great, let's, let's see this Dallas uh, – 
offense go, and and Philip Nelson did not go. So uh, that was my week one uh, shellacking. But that's all right. Like I said, every every week in fantasy in DFS especially is a new week. So uh, we'll roll out a new roster and see if maybe I can get into the green this time. Sounds good, Rod. <laughs> Uh, all right, Matthew, like I said, I know you are battling through uh, this this illness and you've got a couple of meetings to get to, uh, but I, I think our listeners will take 75% you uh, over 0% of you. So I, I'm just so thrilled that you came on the show and gave me the time of day and gave this entire community the time of day because I don't think you understand the stamp of approval that Matthew Barry TMR puts on something when he jumps in. And I think the whole Twitter community for the XFL is so grateful for you uh, to even acknowledge us and to to play along with us and i think uh i think you're doing a good thing for us whether you know it or not well i appreciate that i don't think any of that is necessary but <laughs> very sweet of you to say and i've really enjoyed xfl twitter as it were i think you know i've gotten a lot of my knowledge from following all of you guys and so i would say it right back is thank you guys for you know really grinding and doing the hard work because it's uh it's helped me enjoy uh it's helped me enjoy my XFL fantasy. All right. Well, we are going to let him go, ladies and gentlemen. It is the Mr. Roto himself, uh, Matthew Barry, the definitive voice, the 06010. I, I can go on and on, but I won't because you got to go. So, Matthew, once again, thanks for the time. Thanks, Rod. We're done. That's it. End of the episode. Can you believe it? What an amazing treat to have both of my guests on. David Behrman and Matthew Berry, both of ESPN fame. Uh, man, I, I feel like a kid in a candy store that uh, that just got turned loose with all of uh, all kinds of money and, and able to buy as much candy as he wanted. Uh, I got to tell you, this was an absolute blast to talk to both of them. And, and, and I cannot believe that either one of them said yes to this show I, I just you guys just don't even know how much you all are appreciated for allowing me to bring you the type of content that i'm bringing you and the guests that i'm bringing you because as much as you're enjoying it i am fully enjoying it and i just cannot say enough uh to say thank you to to you and to anybody that listens to the show that interacts with this show that makes this show what it is because Honestly, I do it without you listening, uh, and I've done several shows without anybody listening, but the fact that you do listen and the fact that you do enjoy it just makes us uh, so much more of a pleasurable experience because podcasters sometimes don't feel the love, and uh, I- I'm not, uh, I'm lucky enough to not be in that position. I feel the love. I feel the uh, appreciation that you guys have, and, uh, and I just love to do this. So uh, I hope you enjoyed Matthew. I hope you enjoyed David. Uh, please follow them if you're not already, which I know you are. But, uh, you know, you Matthew Berry, at Matthew Berry TMR. And then uh, you got to follow David at DB1 Sports. Uh, You know, just so much good stuff. So, all right, listen, that's it for this show. Uh, Next episode is coming out on the normal episode Friday. But, of course, this is two a week, so this is normal now, too. Uh, But, uh, yeah, keep this on lock. Subscribe, rate, do all that fun stuff. Keep this show moving up the ranks because uh, it's a lot of fun to watch that arrow move up. And so, yeah. Week two is about to come up, and we'll have the previews. We'll have uh, your fantasy four pack, and we'll have a couple of interviews with some folks in the know, right? I promise to continue to, to, to have fun with you, and as long as you continue to have fun with me, right? Let's do this all together. Great week one. What do you say we do this again in week two, shall we? And in the meantime, don't be like me on the last <laughs> week. Let's actually make some money. <laughs> <laughs>